Here in Northern Colorado, our Western heritage is all around us. Among those capturing and preserving the Old West and the Pioneer Era are the Overland Trail Museum in Sterling, Colorado, and the nearby Fleming Museum. The Overland Trail Museum was uh, opened in 1936 and it was built specifically to be a local history museum. Originally it just started with the uh, main building. It was uh, very, very small, very tiny, just one room. The exterior was uh, designed to somewhat resemble Fort Sedgwick, which is located near uh, Julesburg, about 50 miles east of here. The interior is really interesting. There's a lot of river rock, similar to the work that the WPA did at other locations. And probably the most interesting feature of the original building is the uh, mantle in the fireplace. That's all petrified wood that came from a site near Stoneham. We have 13 buildings which are either replicas or removed here. Most of them are authentic buildings which all came within, from within about a 30 mile radius of Sterling. Uh, we have two barns, this general store, a concrete block house, there's a one-room schoolhouse, a church, a caboose, a train depot, and a signal shack. And those are all authentic buildings, all moved out here. They're great additions to the museum and very interesting. The barbershop is actually a replica of the barbershop in Haxton, Colorado. It was set to be moved up here. It's a concrete building, however, and it was cost prohibitive. So the replica was built and the uh, contents were moved here. Some of the really great exhibits at our museum would be the, uh, the buildings, the outbuildings that were moved here, in particular uh, this general store. This general store was open for a total of 47 years. Uh, it was opened in 1915 and it was in operation until 1962. This store was located in Daly, about 25 miles uh, east of here. Uh, one woman actually ran this store uh, with the assistance of her sons during that time. She was open seven days a week. She also had a lunch counter and was the postmaster. But it's just, uh, it's really wonderful. It's a decisive history. Uh, kids love to come in here. We uh, have a lot of interesting things. They always ask about the rope and the floor. They actually sold the rope. Uh, they put it in the crawl space underneath the floor and pulled it up through the floor and cut it to length for their customers. Kids enjoy looking at all the different products we have. A lot of these items, many of them, uh, were actually uh, around over 100 years ago and are still in use today. Quaker oats, Jell-O, uh, shilling spices, just to name a, a few. So that's really interesting for kids and adults to uh, come in here. Of course, we always get adults coming in saying, uh, you know, I used that when I was a kid. So uh, we get those comments quite a bit. So it's really a slice of Americana. We have a wonderful mural exhibit out in one of our machine sheds outside. There are several freestanding panels. On both sides of the panels are murals of agricultural scenes from the uh, Crook area. Lifelong Bachelor Brothers, called the Brickle Brothers, actually donated a sum of money to the Logan County Historical Society, and that money was used to create this exhibit. And then the entire back wall of that uh, machine shed is also painted, has a uh, wonderful agricultural scene. So that's been a, a great addition to the museum. Folks who have been here before often ask if we still have the two-headed calf. It's a children's favorite. They absolutely love the two-headed calf. Every school group that comes through, uh, their most requested exhibit uh, that they want to see before they leave the museum is the two-headed calf. And that's located in the two-story red barn on the eastern part of the grounds. The two-headed calf was found in a uh, farmer's field uh, near Peets, Colorado, which is uh, north of Sterling. The farmer uh, brought it into Sterling, donated it to St. Anthony's High School, the biology class there actually performed an autopsy on the two-headed calf. Then after performing the autopsy, they sewed her up, uh, removed the organs, preserved her, uh, put her, and it is a female, put her in a uh, case and presented her to the museum, and we've had her ever since. And that was uh, back in the 60s, so she's been out here for several decades now. The Overland Trail Museum is a great place for families. We have a lot of activities for the kids, but we have a lot of history here, a lot of interesting exhibits. Uh, kids and parents uh, can learn together. It's a step back in time. It allows uh, children to learn uh, things that they've probably never been exposed to before. It also may remind uh, folks of some things from their childhood. It's definitely worth your while to come out to the museum and check it out.
The Overland Trail Museum commemorates the historic westward migration of gold seekers and early pioneers. Come join us for a nostalgic trip to your own past, no matter where you come from. And while you're there, take the short drive to visit the Fleming Museum, a lovely hometown museum in a unique two-story train depot. Our pride and joy here in Fleming is our depot. It was moved from across the road over by the other elevator and we painted it to historical colors. We had brochures from the railroad company so we'd know exactly what color to paint it. We thought it was kind of odd having the bright gold, but that is what it was. We also have a museum. It's an old schoolhouse and was used for the kindergarten class in Fleming for a while. Everything in our museum was donated by local people, so it's all local items. It tells a history of our town. We have things from saddles to equipment that they used to use to farm back then. A lot of old historical home items. Um, we even have the original telephone operator's booth. We do have a two-story depot here, and upstairs is set up like they used to live in it a long time ago. And they definitely did live up there and run the railroad station. It never had running water, never had electricity, and there is no bathroom, there is no sink, and they had to haul their water up those stairs. They're very steep stairs, but it gives you a perspective of how they lived. Uh, they had to have a wood stove to keep themselves warm, and again, they had a wood stove in the depot to keep the depot warm, but it's got to be a lot different than what you're used to now. There is an outhouse that sits out back here. That is the original outhouse for the depot. Uh, no longer in use, of course. It, it's a real interesting thing to see how people used to live. It wasn't easy. And we you know sometimes we think life isn't easy. It wasn't easy back then. They had to work to live. Being a native of Colorado, we often took trips to Estes Park by way of Highway 36 through Lyons, and it wasn't until recently that we took the trip to Estes Park by way of the Big Thompson Canyon, and it absolutely blew me away. We recently took my 75-year-old mother through that same scenic drive, and she said it is well worth your time to take the trip up the Big Thompson Canyon. Here's a little peek at why you want to plan your next trip or just a Sunday drive through the Big Thompson Canyon. Well, the opportunity to see different landscapes in Loveland as you drive west from I-25 is just unbeatable. You're gonna have the farming plains community. Then you're gonna be through town and you're gonna have these hog backs where it looks like the land just rose up from a sleeping giant. Then you're gonna hit the mouth of the canyon where it looks like the giant totally rolled over and all of the dishes got uh, stacked up on their sides. And then you're gonna enjoy uh, the valley and the canyon. And then you pop out into Estes Valley and the mountains are right in front of you just begging to be climbed. So in addition to the wonderful geography experience you're going to have driving from Loveland to Estes Park, you're also going to experience all the wonderful native wildlife that the Division of Wildlife and Colorado has to offer. The bighorn sheep like to make an appearance uh, climbing down the rocky parts of the canyon, uh, so a lot of tourists like to stop and take pictures there, that's, that's always enjoyable. We're actually installing watchable wildlife signs specific to bighorn sheep viewing. And those are going in uh, along the Big Thompson Canyon and we'll have a viewing station at Idlewild Dam. Well, up the canyon from uh, Loveland, going westbound on your way to Estes, you can stop at the Wooden Indian and have a view of it, a beautiful piece of artwork that is on private property but is available for viewing. Then, of course, is the dam store, which has the tower and some t-shirts if you need some for friends and family. The cherry cider store as you go up the canyon is, is always a fun place to take the kids in and have samples of cherry cider. 
The fly fishing part is huge. You'll see several fly fishermen up and down the river. Then up the canyon, we're gonna have watchable wildlife signs that you can visit and view and also look for wildlife. There is the Vista Smith Park and Round Mountain Park for hiking and picnicking and fishing. One rock formation as you go west up the Big Thompson Canyon, if you stop right around mile marker 71 and you turn around and look back east, you'll see uh, a rock formation called Cherub Rock and it looks like a couple of cherubs kissing. Farther up the canyon, at about a mile marker 77, there is Idlewild Dam, which is also a fishing area and rest area. And across the street is a wonderful memorial to the victims and first responders to the 1976 Big Thompson flood. The town of Drake is the, the first little town you'll hit as you come up through the Big Thompson Canyon. You'll start by seeing the Big Thompson Canyon Fire Department, and as you move west into Drake proper, there's a teeny post office, a restaurant, there's a deli, usually an ice cream stand along the way. The turnoff says Glenhaven, so this very small town of Glenhaven would be off to your right, up, up County Road 43. Glenhaven um, is well known in the area for its cinnamon rolls on Sunday morning. So there's a bakery there and they do produce very tasty cinnamon rolls and have a general store, you know, sell local crafts and that kind of thing. As Glen Haven Road or County Road 43, also known as Devil's Gulch Road, curves up, um, that's a secondary route to Estes. So if you take that scenic route up there, you'll eventually get to Estes Park and come right up on top of the crest of the hill where you'll see um, Long's Peak and, and the whole mountain range. If you go to uh, Larimer County Road 43, you're going to drive up a nice windy canyon road through Glen Haven onto the back side of Estes Park. And if you continue on Highway 34, you're going to be able to visit a couple of more small canyon parks and also Sleepy Hollow Park, which is run by um, Estes Recreation District. In your drive up, up the Big Thompson Canyon, uh, after seeing the sites like the Cherry Cider Store, you're going to come across a number of bed and breakfasts, and I would encourage everyone to stop and, and check out the, the small businesses along the Big Thompson Canyon because you won't find a chain, you won't find a you know, big conglomerate of, of any type of business. It's all very unique uh, storefronts or uh, you know, small mom and pop type places. You can access uh, Estes Park via Highway 36 out of Lyons or uh, Highway 34 out of Loveland. And I would recommend the Highway 34 route just because it has so many places to stop and see and visit. You can make a day out of it. There's places to picnic, there's places to rest, there's places to hike. You'll want to meet the people in the Big Thompson Canyon, and if you spend a few minutes here and there, you'll find that it's a lot of history, a lot of uh, local background, and it's great to take your family through and just see the sights. You know, one of the colorful characters in our early history was a man whose name was George Robert Strauss, or they called him Bob. And from what I understand, he was, he was robbed. They took his horse and everything. He ended up walking and he got to the Cache La Poudre and decided maybe this is where you should settle. So he moved down the river and a place that was later called Howes Lane that would be down near where Lincoln Green's golf course is today. He built a cabin and then in 1864, when the flood that wiped out Camp Collins out at La Porte caught him in his cabin, and he managed to get out of the floodwaters and get to higher ground, and, but his cabin was destroyed. Yeah, so he moved, uh, he moved down uh, stream a little bit further and uh, built what became known as the Strauss Cabin, which is 
right at the very east end, or near the east end of Horsetooth Road. What's ironic about Strauss is that the flood of 1864 forced him to move, but it was the flood of 1904 that uh, took his life. Forty years later, he was in his 70s and couldn't get out of the floodwaters. And... Pinned up against a fence by the force of the water. His old cabin just sat there abandoned all these years. And then uh, Larimer County came along in 1997 and restored the cabin and opened the cabin up as a historic site. Yeah, and then about 15 years ago, some teenagers burned the cabin to the ground. If you're an avid outdoor sportsman, you'll find many hunting options in Logan County, Colorado. Logan County is, the whole county is open hunting. You can come out here and hunt anywhere. The biggest thing you need to be aware of is that it's pretty much all private property. And in Colorado, you have to have permission to enter private property. We do have some public. Uh, there's some state wildlife areas on the South Platte River. Uh, North Sterling State Park is some public hunting also. Um, but basically, you can hunt almost anywhere. There's wildlife and game species anywhere in the county. There's everything from small game to big game. Um, you know, pheasants, waterfowl, several kinds of ducks from mallards to wood ducks. Uh, we get a really big migration, uh, several types of geese. We get snow geese in through Logan County and Canada geese. All the way up through, we have mule deer, white-tailed deer, antelope, and we have some elk too every now and then that get taken out here on the plains. The Division of Wildlife works with landowners to increase habitat. Habitat is the key. Um, if you're talking pheasants or deer or anything, habitat is the key. They have to have home, they have to have shelter, food. So we partnership with Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever, a lot of these conservation groups, and we put money on the ground to make sure that there's habitat so there's a lot of wildlife out there to be found. So what you're looking for is you're looking for these tree plots um, that Pheasants Forever puts in. You're looking for shallow wetlands that have been improved, and, and this is also on public and private. Um, so that's what you're looking for. And, and we put a lot of time and effort in trying to make sure that there's habitat and food and shelter for those animals. When people first start hunting or when they, they come to this area, they have a tendency to think that it's gonna be easy. Um, you, you look at our landscape and you know most people are like, well, it's really flat. Um, well, you know, and that's why a lot of people don't realize that we have deer out here, um, especially our mule deer. You kind of have to take in everything that's out there, you know. We do a lot of education with people. We'll try to teach them how to see game first, and that's, you know, you're going to see tracks on most animals before you're going to see the animals. So once you start seeing where they're at, then you can start finding them too and knowing their hours of movement and things like that. I would encourage people that are hunting to make sure that they visit our website or make sure they pick up our regulations brochures because that's something that you really need to key in on on what you're hunting, you know, is making sure you know when the season starts. It doesn't start the same day every year necessarily. Uh, making sure that you know what the bag limit is, what your possession limit is, things like that. There are some species you can hunt year round. Uh, most of them have a season, and the majority of it starts September 1st. Morning doves kicks us off, uh, and then we have some teal hunting. And it's generally wrapped up by mid-January to the end of January, but there are a few species that you can hunt year-round. Coyotes open year-round, prairie dogs on private properties year-round. Hunting requires a lot of preparation. Um, and I would say probably more than half of that is going to be just doing your homework. Uh, trying to find maps and doing a lot of uh, studying and on what, you know, what the habits of the animals are. Uh, there's kind of a saying out there that 90% uh, of the animals are, that are taken are taken by about 10% of the hunters. And that's really true. You find people that are really good at what they do. And that's because they've taken the time to study. They constantly work at getting better at what they do. And you know, as a district wildlife manager, I spend a lot of time, especially with youth, trying to get them into that because you know, if you want to be successful, you have to learn. You have to learn from somebody that knows what they're doing, or you have to do a lot of studying. So, 
That's one thing I really recommend to people is that uh, either you get with somebody that's successful or you ask them. I mean, I'm, I'm a passionate pheasant hunter and I love teaching people how to hunt pheasants and be successful. And you know, there's, there's people out there that are the same way with mule deer or whatever the species is and I would really suggest that you, you pick their brains and you study and you work with them and that way you'll find a lot more success and it'll, it'll be a lot more enjoyable to you. As a district wildlife manager, I have the exact same authority as a state trooper or a sheriff's officer. And most of the property out here is private property and you have to have permission to, to go on that property. That being said, you also have to have a hunting license. Um, your buddy can't say, come on out and let's go pheasant hunting today. There's two major requirements that everybody has to have. You have to have a hunter safety before you can ever hunt. Um, everybody in the state has to have a hunter safety card. And then you have to purchase the proper license to go out and hunt as well. And that's probably our biggest violation hunting wise is hunting without a proper and valid license. The second one is, is a loaded firearm in a motor vehicle, which really deals with safety. Um, almost every one of our accidents in nearly all of our fatalities occur within about seven feet of a vehicle and that's because when people get done hunting or before they get ready to go hunting they have those guns loaded around their vehicles so it's really dangerous so that's a really big violation and that's one that we don't let slide at all. So for more information if you would like to get a hold of us uh, you can stop by our brush office at uh, 122 East Edison or you can call 970-842-6300 and our website has just an amazing amount of information. Education, if you want to learn about wildlife, if you want to get all the rules and regulations and that's wildlife.state.co.us and I'd encourage you to go there and uh, you can find out pretty much anything you want. I'd also encourage you to call a district wildlife manager like me and I'd be glad to talk to you and give you all the information I can. Enjoying the family friendly sport of lake fishing in northern Colorado is easy. The city of Loveland alone has five well stocked lakes within just a few miles. Close enough to take a quick trip but nice enough to spend the whole day. Uh, we have uh, great river fishing, but we also have uh, really, really good still water fishing, a small pond and lake fishing right here almost in town. is a great activity it's uh, it's a challenge and it's nostalgic I fished with my father and my sister when I was young so I, uh, I recall those good times it's a good family activity one that will get you talking and get you out from in front of the television and away from the computer Well, fishing in Loveland is uh, a classic opportunity for all fishermen, all levels of ability, families, experts, etc. We have elite fly fishing in the Big Thompson Canyon, we have family ponds, we have warm water fishing, we have cold water fishing, we even have native fish species that um, you wouldn't fish for necessarily, but it's good to know that they're still in the area. For Larimer County Parks, you can uh, put a boat on at Carter Lake and also at Pinewood Reservoir, but not at Flat Iron Reservoir. And all three have trout. Carter Lake is known for walleye fishing and also has a nice uh, array of trails and campgrounds around it. They have a brand new marina. And at Flatiron, it's a nice campground area with a fishing pier and a very low key, uh, no motor boating type reservoir. So very nice for families. At Pinewood, we stock the elusive tiger muskie. 
The Division of Wildlife has a wonderful program called Fishing is Fun. And what that allows is communities, nonprofit organizations, um, interested publics to partner with the Division of Wildlife and federal funding to improve fishing in a local area. An example in Loveland is Jayhawker Ponds. These were gravel ponds that the city purchased and then the Division of Wildlife along with the city and grant money uh, rehabilitated the banks in the area and stocked the waters with fish for a public fishing opportunity. And so that's been a really great partnership and we offer those partnerships all across the state. This truly is a wild trout water. The state does not stock this stretch. Uh, it has over 2,700 fish per running mile in it. Uh, the fish will average anywhere from 8 to 12, 13 inches with some up to 20. There's a lot of opportunities right below the dam at Estes. It actually stays open year round and people fish it year round. Further down, the first half of the river from Estes to halfway down to Loveland is actually a catch and release fly and lure only area whereas the rest of the river on down to Loveland is open with the normal state regulations. It's a wonderful fishery. It's ranked in the top 10 in Colorado in terms of the number of fish, top three as far as the northeast part of the state. So it's a great, great fishery. There's a mix of private and public land. The U.S. Forest Service, City of Loveland, Larimer County all have public lands up and down the river. Many, many pull-offs. There are five major parks between Loveland and Estes, so you can actually bring your family, picnic. You have to see a lot of wildlife. If you do decide to come up, I encourage you to hit one of the local angling shops in Loveland to really get some up-to-date recent information on what's going on in terms of fishery. All those people are going to be very helpful and really a little homework will make your trip that much more productive. This is a very high quality premier fishery and with that said I'm going to go cast a line and see what's happening. Every place is different and every fish you catch is an individual. Not all of them should be eaten, some of them should be put back. How good do you feel when you've caught a great big fish and you know she's full of eggs and you give her a big kiss and put her back so she's gonna, so you'll have more fish next year. Thanks for joining us on NOCO Link. As always, we'd love to hear from you, so visit us on the web at nocolink.com or on YouTube where you can view previous shows. Special thanks to our partners, Realities for Children Charities, dedicated to serving the unmet needs of abused and neglected children in Larimer County. Janice's wardrobe is provided by Clothes to Home, where you'll find women's clothing, jewelry, handbags, home decor, furniture, and much more.